Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today as we discuss the future of manufacturing in our region. These are our partners for today, the City of Auburn, City of Pacific, City of Algona, Port of Seattle, Office of Economic Development for the City of Auburn, Auburn Area Chamber of Commerce, CAMPS, the Center for Advanced Manufacturing in the Puget Sound, and the Department of Commerce. Uh, also at the top, the Auburn Innovation Partnership Zone. So clearly, we, all of these sponsors have an understanding of the importance of manufacturing in our region. Uh, it's a part, really, of the very fabric of our country. It's a key component in growing our economy, it drives research, product development and creation, and pushes us to continue to invest in our future. Now more than ever, manufacturing is also leading our communities by continuing the advancement of living wage jobs. That's something that we're doing in cities and schools here, which is a partnership between the cities of Auburn, Algona, Pacific, Auburn School District, and Green River College. We understand the importance of those family wage middle income jobs and decided about a year and a half ago that that would be the focus for our organization. And the partnership between the cities looking at how do we encourage uh, apprenticeships uh, with the contracts that we have with other businesses and also Green River College and the Auburn School District are already working on how do we get those all important credits and the experience for our students. We know not everyone is four year college bound or even two year college bound, but just as important are those apprenticeship programs and the trades are so vitally important to our community that we are really proud to have that partnership going on. Mayor Geyer is here uh, who was integral in making that happen for the, our organization. So we know that manufacturing strengthens our communities from the ground up by increasing the quality of life within our cities. That is so obvious. We are, we are proud of what occurs in our cities because of manufacturing. Money generated by local manufacturers not only feeds directly back into our community through taxable revenue, but through the strong workforce that it supports. Our challenge now is to ensure that we're laying the groundwork to ensure this industry's continued success by developing a trained and ready workforce for the next generation of manufacturing. In Auburn, that has meant coming together to make connections between our high schools, as I mentioned, and Green River College to foster innovation and engagement in the trade skills at the very start of a student's career path. It has meant, it has meant investing our time and energy into developing strong apprenticeship programs. It has meant pushing ourselves to further these connections and again, through the, community, through the cities and schools program that we work on every day. So it's my honor to be here today to ha and have such an esteemed panel to uh, speak with you today as we discuss these opportunities and also the challenges and what we look toward the future and ask ourselves, what is next? And right now, it is my esteemed pleasure to give you a little bit of information about our first speaker. Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib grew up in East King County and graduated from the Bellevue International School before attending Columbia University, Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and Yale Law School. After receiving his law degree, Lieutenant Governor Habib returned to Washington State, thank goodness, where he helped start up technology companies, raise venture capital funds, and license their software. Washington State's 16th Lieutenant Governor in 2016, he represented East King County in the Washington State Senate, where he served as Democratic Whip and member of the Democratic Leadership Team. Prior to that, he served as a member of the State House of Representatives. In his role as Lieutenant Governor, he presides over the State Senate, serves as Acting Governor when the Governor is out of state, and maintains a portfolio of issues including veteran and disability employment, access to higher education, and creating, uh, creating a college-going culture and economic development, trade, and international relations. Please help me welcome Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib. Well, thank you, Mayor. Wonderful to be here with you, Mayor Geyer, others. Um, I want to say something about uh, uh, Mayor Backus, real quick, because, um, she, and she doesn't know I'm going to say this, but um, uh, I am uh, 
overwhelmed with um, envy uh, and because you know I had the great pleasure along with Doug and uh, several Auburn businesses and others from around the state, I had the pleasure of leading a trade delegation to South Korea in September. And part of that, uh, as part of that trip, we went to Pyeongchang, which is Auburn's sister city, and more, uh, more, more uh, famously, site of the upcoming 2018 Winter Olympics. Um, and we went there, we took like a four hour bus ride there and back, uh, to go visit Auburn's sister city. And I just found out a couple weeks ago that um, a, a, in addition to the other fruit that that trip bore for our state, um, Nancy Backus gets to go and sit on stage at the opening ceremony of the 2018 Winter Olympics. So you all have another reason to watch uh, that opening <laughs> ceremony. Just remember that it was the Lieutenant Governor uh, who, who, who made that possible for the city of Auburn. <laughs> Um, it, I'm still waiting for my invitation. Instead I, I, instead, I get to stay up late with members of the state senate passing bills until one in the morning. Um, so uh, I, I want to just say a big word of thank you to um, the city of Auburn and, and all the um, sponsors and those who have come together to put this roundtable um, event together to have this important discussion. Uh, as you heard, um, my office, and you'll be excused for not knowing what the lieutenant governor does. It's that's okay. It's different in each state, and it's different actually from office holder to office holder. Um, but some things stay the same. You heard, you know, I, I do serve as the president of the state senate. I do serve as a partner to the governor, um, both filling in for him when he's out of state and working with him um, to reach throughout our state um, year round. Uh, and then that we, we run a small agency that focuses on economic development um, and higher education and workforce development. So um, right at the nexus of the, the issues that affect the manufacturing sector. And you know, there are there's so many different ways that we can talk about uh, the role that manufacturing plays in our state and what the future will bring and how we can work and partner together. For example, we could talk about how integral to the success of manufacturing in our state um, is uh, is our uh, our, our uh, thriving uh, sea and airports. How we need to uh, support our ports, uh, do more to create critical infrastructure, uh, including uh, building off the transportation package that was passed by the Senate. I was there for that in 2015 to make sure that uh, our goods uh, can reach uh, ports uh, bound for overseas and that. Uh, the uh, the uh, in integral component parts from the supply chain can reach our manufacturing facilities here in Washington State. So we know that transportation, not only just a question of uh, commuter convenience and sanity, but also uh, a vital part of ensuring uh, our future in manufacturing in Washington State. Um, so we could talk about that. We, we, you know, we certainly could talk about the importance of um, promoting Washington overseas internationally as, um, as, as I did with Auburn and, and others in, in South Korea, um, pushing for uh, increased trade on terms that make sense for Washington State and for our workers and for our companies and that maximize our advantage, uh, uh, competitive advantage globally. Um, I think it's important to talk about that, but what I wanna focus on uh, because it's, it's really what we've been working on um, most recently and most intensively in my office is around uh, workforce development. And, uh, you know, I want to be a little bit, uh, I wouldn't even say provocative, but I want to um, challenge a, uh, a misconception that's out there in my mind, a false dichotomy that's been created uh, between uh, college and no college or this idea that there are uh, two tracks or there ought to be two tracks and some people will go to college and some people will not go to college. And, um, and I think that when you look at not just the future of manufacturing, but really what Washington State is poised to be successful at in the manufacturing economy, we know it's different. We know that despite what some politicians may say, um, the future of manufacturing is not about making America something that it was before, turning back the clock. It's about the advanced manufacturing, technology-driven, 
that not only amplifies our ability to use technology and what computers and robots can do, but also by doing so amplifies our human ability to add value. And so we know that there's a really, really vital link between education and the future of manufacturing. Now, when this topic comes up, there's often this dichotomy created uh, as if there are only two choices. And those choices are uh, to, uh, when you're in high school, transition to a skill center um, and um, position yourself uh, essentially, uh, or, or to, to, to concede or to decide that you will never go to college, but that you want to have a purely vocational training starting at age 15, um, never to look back again. Or on the other hand, that you're headed for a, uh, an, an ivy-covered quadrangle where you will read uh, Greek uh, uh, philosophical tomes uh, in a small seminar context. Um, and uh, the, the reality is that not only is that not optimal, it certainly doesn't need to be that way. And uh, so what, what we're focused on in my office is uh, in partnership with the governor uh, is to try to chart a different path, one that puts Washingtonians, one that puts our people at the center of the services that we provide, of the educational system that we provide. Because we know that people will, people want to be able to move fluidly and have maximal options and choices at every single point. So it could be that at age 15 or age 16, a student wants one thing. Could be that for any number of reasons at age 19, age 20, age 30, or age 55, they want something different. So what we need is we need these systems to work together much more closely. So you all are familiar with the governor's Career Connected Learning Initiative. Uh, just a couple months ago, he traveled to Europe and got to learn about how Switzerland and Germany have uh, for years now placed manufacturing really at the center of their economic success uh, by developing high quality apprenticeship programs um, in fields much broader than what we have here in the United States. And that in doing so, they have been able to uh, not only preserve but expand wages and benefits and the quality of life for people of, with all sorts of, of, of interests, um, intellectual interests and physical abilities. Uh, they've been able to do that. And so uh, he, through executive order and now through some request legislation is uh, looking to expand our conception of apprenticeships here in Washington State to incentivize and encourage the creation of new pathways where you learn and earn at the same time in emerging fields uh, to make sure that we are at the cutting edge of manufacturing and that young people will always have the confidence to see a way forward that intrigues them that inspires them, that activates their imagination. But well, we're working with his office and with the state legislature ourselves to make sure that those opportunities, both existing apprenticeships in the trades and in manufacturing, and new ones that we create as part of this initiative are also connected to college attainment pathways. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you look at bachelor's degrees, and I'll give you the, the first example. It's not directly from the manufacturing context, it's from the building trades, but we're looking right now at creating a bachelor's in construction management that will uh, capture and recognize the prior learning that takes place uh, in apprenticeships in the trades. The idea being that if you've gone through one of these rigorous skilled apprenticeships, whether it's in electrical work or uh, as a plumber or uh, as a uh, sheet metal worker, that if you've done that work and then you've been on the job site and learned how to work with others in that context and understood how the pieces come together in a construction project, that you're already bringing really valuable technical knowledge and also 
the kind of social and cultural understanding of construction so that you don't need to start as a freshman in a bachelor's in construction management. We ought to be able to give you online the courses that you need to finish out that bachelor's degree, whether it's during your apprenticeship or at some later point so that you can either come home from the job site or on the weekend be able to uh, uh, finish out your general education requirements for a bachelor's degree. Well, what does that do? That means that, you know, if whether it's a, a, a back injury or just a decision to change your, uh, what, where you want to live or wh how, what you want to work on, how, what your day looks like, and you want to maybe start your own subcontracting firm, go into business with others, uh, you can go out there and get that bachelor's degree in construction management. Maybe when you're 50 years old, you want to change to a different sort of lifestyle, um, you can do that with a bachelor's degree and the accounting and other knowledge that you get uh, in addition to the skills that you've earned, uh, that, you've, that you've learned while earning money as an apprentice and then as a journeyman. So that's one example that we're already hard at work at implementing, again, connecting the idea of career-connected learning with college degree pathways, two-year, four-year, and beyond. And the manufacturing sector is prime position to do the same thing. There's some history of that um, uh, up in Snohomish County with Boeing and the machinists and, uh, and the institutions of higher education up in Snohomish County. Uh, but we want to take that, we want to expand it even further because we know that for most people, it's difficult to, to say I'm going to take a you know leave from work or I'm going to postpone starting my job so that I can go and study some more. So let's use technology. Let's use the internet and online course delivery so that people can continue to work and go to work as a journeyman or uh, in their full-time employment while continuing their path to a bachelor's degree. It's also important because when we go out and recruit uh, other companies to expand jobs here in Washington State. They're looking for, well, what's the difference maker here in Washington? And if you look historically, we've never been strong in this state by being a low value add state on anything. Okay, my dad worked at Boeing for decades. And, you know, what makes people proud at Boeing is not, you know, how low we can cut our taxes or, you know, how little we can pay people. What makes people proud to go to work at Boeing is the quality and the knowledge and the depth of human understanding that goes back, in some cases, four generations of knowledge in how to make, assemble airplanes for civilian use to expand our horizons and, and, and shrink our world and bring us closer to each other and for defense purposes to keep us each safe every single night. That's what makes people proud. And it's the human knowledge that we invest in that has made us a competitive place. If you look at the growing sectors in high tech, Amazon and Microsoft, why do they, why do they stay here? Why do they grow here? Because of the knowledge that we have and the, and the skilled workforce. Well, that's also true for manufacturing. So let's continue that race to the top by taking what we know works, which is career-connected learning aimed at the jobs of today and tomorrow, but then connect it to long-term degree pathways that prepare people for the jobs of this next century. And now I want to close by saying, you know, I, I, I think back when I think about this great industry and uh, not only its legacy, but really its, its future, there's a few moments that really stand out for me. One is, um, of course, I mentioned my dad working at Boeing and uh, the ability that I had uh, as a kid who became blind as a child and child of immigrants and, you know, faced a number of different obstacles, but the ability that I had, thanks to the income that he was able to make at our largest private employer, the Boeing Company, uh, to be able to go on to college and to be able to be in a position here to speak with people who know far more than I do about the topic that I'm talking about. Well, that, that was made possible uh, by this industry. And I think about that house when I, when I was, um, I, I uh, started practicing as a lawyer. I was uh, living in a house, renting a house uh, in the 48th District in Kirkland in the Houghton neighborhood. 
uh, right about a three minute walk from Lake Washington. And you know, if, you're, if you've been there, this is actually, it's very close to where uh, the Seahawks uh, training facility used to be um, in, in near Carillon Point. And you, if you're there, um, there, a lot of the houses are changing now, but this house that I lived in and, and still hundreds of houses all around it are these old uh, uh, ramblers, these uh, maybe thousand square foot, you know, detached carport, um, uh, you know, uh, houses that were built all very similarly for the shipbuilders. Because of course, that was the heart of shipbuilding, uh, not only uh, in our region, uh, but to support our Navy in World War II and, and, and for years afterwards. Uh, and these houses were all built in the early 40s uh, for thousands and thousands of shipyard workers, of shipbuilders, and they bespeak a, t a, a form of, of middle class prosperity. This idea that there was economic security associated with manufacturing. And I always remember when I would go home to that house and I would always just be, remember that this was the legacy, but also that that in a, in, a, in a very important way shows us the way forward. That why, why, why did they build here? And what type of institutional knowledge was built for those workers? And I thought about each of those people that had lived in, in that house and in all the houses around it and the knowledge that they had that positioned us so well. Many of them had come from serving in the Navy. And, and then the third experience is probably the most touching is um, I've had the chance several times, and if you haven't, I really urge you to do this, to go and visit the Lighthouse for the Blind. Um, and uh, there's a, the main locations in South Seattle. There's also one in Spokane. Um, and the Lighthouse for the Blind is, a, uh, is an organization that provides light manufacturing jobs for people who are blind and blind, deaf blind, both deaf and blind, and people who are blind with other disabilities. And uh, they employ over 200 people, over 200 people who are blind, deaf blind, or blind with other disabilities in manufacturing. And if you go there and they supply to Boeing, they supply to the Defense Department, um, you know, they make um, air canisters for, I remember at the time when I first went there, for, they were for our troops in the Middle East, and, uh, and, and it is just so inspiring to see people working with their hands, working with their minds, intellectually and physically engaged, who in many cases would be told that they're good for nothing that they're you know, uh, worthy of a social security disability check and that's it. But that the Lighthouse for the Blind has created workforce development for people who, despite having the same obstacle that I have and in many cases far more, uh, nevertheless are experiencing the dignity of work, uh, the dignity of good wages and benefits and pensions and you know, and set their, pe their feet on that path. And many of them go on and work in other places after that. And the Lighthouse helps other manufacturers accommodate their workplaces for people with disabilities. So when I think about those three experiences that I've had uh, with this sector, with, a, with very large employer and with small employers, uh, it, it, it fills me with a, a true optimism of what can be done to expand opportunities for every single Washingtonian and every family to be able to experience the American dream. But let's always remember that at the center of that are the people. And I know that every, every good employer views it exactly that way. That at the center of it is the people and the, the very human stories of each person and the families that they're supporting. And as long as we as policymakers keep that in mind, why are we doing this? We're doing this to give people opportunities and economic stability. As long as we do that, and as long as our private sector is a great partner with us in that work, I am 100% confident that not only will we continue to be strong in our current manufacturing sectors and industries and verticals, but we will be the leaders in the technology-driven manufacturing sector 
and man, advanced manufacturing, value-added manufacturing of the 21st century and beyond. And I look forward to using my office in conjunction with my colleagues in state government to support all of you in doing that work. Once again, thank you all so much for having me here and enjoy the rest of your day here talking to one another. Thank you. Isn't it comforting to know that we have the state support that supports our core values here in this region and that a strong work ethic is nothing to, to be ashamed of. And manufacturing is one of those opportunities to grow and to show that strong work ethic and the core values in our region. Uh, I want you to, to understand how important manufacturing and all of the work that's been going on is to our city. Uh, I mentioned Mayor Leanne Geyer from the City of Pacific. Also with us here today are several Auburn City Council members, including our Deputy Mayor, Bob Baggett. <laughs> Council Member Bill Peloza. <laughs> Council Member John Holman. <laughs> Council Member Yolanda Trout Manuel. <laughs> and our newest Council Member, Larry Brown. So I'd like to introduce to you our panelists today, give you a little bit of their background, and then turn it over to them, because that's who you're here to listen to after Lieutenant Governor Habib uh, gave us such great insights. Jack Meehan is the site leader of Boeing Fabrication Auburn. Jack's been with Auburn for 30 years and has led a number of units for the Boeing company. Under his leadership, the Auburn site has become a key component within the Boeing organization. A major, major accomplishment is the new Workforce Readiness Center that will train the Boeing workforce for current and future missions. We had the opportunity to, to be there for the ribbon cutting, if you will, on uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it was very exciting. That was the first new building on the Auburn campus in over 25 years, and it is a beautiful facility that proves Boeing's dedication to this region and to manufacturing. Please welcome Jack Meehan. We also have Kelly Maloney. Kelly is president and CEO of the Aerospace Futures Alliance. Kelly is engaged on many fronts in securing the future of aerospace in Washington. She is a former city council member for the city of Federal Way and has her master's degree from Gonzaga University. Please welcome Kelly Maloney. Also with us today is Lou Kelleher. Lou has been the Career and Technical Education Director for the Auburn School District for the past three years, where he oversees sixth through 12th grades programs spanning middle school mecha mechatronics? That's a new word for me, mechatronics, and computer science to high school engineering, aerospace, automotive, and more. Lou is also the past president of Washington Association for Career and Technical Educators, as well as being a teacher of career and technical field for over 30 years in both the middle and high school levels. During this time, he has run programs in machining, welding, construction, engineering, and applied physics. Please welcome Lou Kelleher. And also on our panel today, Todd A. Cleland, PhD, Director of Corporate Relations for the University of Washington's Central Corporate and Foundation, Foundation Relations Office. His primary focus is developing research partnerships with companies and leading strategic projects to improve the environment for corporate relations. He also serves as a general liaison to help direct companies to the right places based on their needs and their interests. Our office is a front door for the industry, he says. Todd received his BSc from Princeton University, his PhD in chemical engineering from Berkeley, and a master's degree in SM management, management of technology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please welcome Todd A. Cleland. And at this point, I'm gonna get off the stage and let them work their magic with you. Thank you all for being here today.
Great. Thank you, Mayor Beckus. Um, first of all, I just want to say, uh, first, well, thank you for having me here, everyone. My name is Kelly Maloney. I run the Aer Aerospace Futures Alliance. And I just want to make a suggestion in the future, if I ever share the stage with Lieutenant um, Governor Habib, don't, don't put me near him because he is amazing. The way he, he presents is just amazing. So have me at the end. <laughs> I don't want to follow him. Um, I want to thank you again for having me here. I, I love Auburn and um, I have known Mayor Beckus for a while and all of the council pretty much for a while uh, and I just love um, coming here and being a part of your community. Uh, I worked in Auburn for a while for Orion Industries. I see Kathy back there. Hi Kathy uh, from Orion and uh, work with several of you as well. So it's exciting to be here for me. So the Aerospace, the Aerospace Futures Alliance was founded in 2006 to create a strong, cohesive voice for industry, and we rep represent the aeros um, aerospace manufacturers and related businesses around the state. And uh, today we brought our most recent magazine, Liftwa. If you want a copy, there's there are on, on the desk over there. So feel free to take one. Uh, we talk about in that issue the economic impact uh, of aerospace in the state, which is pretty significant, as you can imagine. Um, you may already know that um, Auburn plays. Auburn is a major player, major player in aerospace in the state, and uh, we have companies, as I mentioned, like Orion, but of course Boeing, Skills, TTF, AMI, AIM, and um, just to name just to name a few. And uh, those, uh, the co types of companies those represent are machine shops, design firms, raw materials suppliers, and parts suppliers. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, legislation as it pertains to aerospace and general manufacturing. We'll touch a little bit about a little bit on uh, the uh, economic impact of aerospace, and also the Boeing NMA. Last fall, Democrats um, gained a seat in the Senate, which uh, gave them a one-vote switch and uh, the ability to pass uh, their own policy agendas, or, or I should say, uh, choose the policy agendas that they, uh, they are looking forward to uh, per pursuing and to choose committee chairs. They also controlled the governor's seat and the, the House. With one week left before the major, first major policy committee cutoff, of the 2018 session, the committees are racing to hear bills and then vote them out of committee. As many of you know, carbon has been a Democratic policy, the top Democratic party platform for a while, and now with the Democratic control, there are a number of bills that have to do with carbon tax policy. This year, Governor Inslee introduced carbon tax policy that basically imposes a $20 per metric ton uh, charge on the sale and use of fossil fuels. It taxes the fuels at the point of purchase. For example, for gas stations, um, for a gas station retailer, when they buy the fuel, they are uh, charged the, the tax, and then they would presumably pass that tax on to their customers. Likewise, for manufacturers, it, when you purchase uh, fuel, you would be charged the tax at the upfront, and you would presumably also chart, uh, pass that tax on to your customers. However, for manufacturing, we need to also consider the potential impact on suppliers and smaller businesses, but not necessarily related to fossil fuels. The real issue is whether this bill is extended to include emissions. So. Um, in the course of doing business, if your business were to have excessive, what could, what could be considered excessive carbon emissions, a certain threshold that might be uh, determined, you would have a tax imposed on those emissions. This is currently not being um, considered, but it is something that AFA is keeping an eye on. Another issue is an attempt to roll back the B&O tax rate on manufacturers so that they are consistent with, the aer with what aerospace currently gets, which is 0.2904%. So um, this is something that AFA supported last year, and um, it was line item vetoed out of the budget last year by the governor at the 11th hour. But uh, this year it's come back in the form of several bills. Um, two that we support are House Bill 2393, and Senate Bill 6542. We'll see where those go, um, but we are very much interested in seeing those move forward. 
Um, and I'm just going to move right on to um, the reason, well, the reason those, we think this is important is because it levels out the playing field for manufacturers. And not only do we have an interest in all manufacturers and all businesses having um, parity in regard to um, the B&O tax rate, we also have a, a, an interest for our, our supplier base, which many of them have diversified their customer base uh, outside of, uh, I should say, in addition to their, their, bo their um, Boeing and other OEM and other um, uh, customers in order to uh, uh, <laughs> remain competitive uh, and with the cycles that you see in aerospace. So as the global aerospace pressures hit our suppliers and the work orders go up and down at times um, by diversifying into maritime or medical or marine or high tech or what have you, they are able to better withstand the cyclicality of that, of the, um, of the industry. And so we highly support this, uh, this idea of uh, reduced B&O tax, taxes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about aerospace in Washington and the economic impact. Um, as you probably know, um, quite a few aerospace companies utilize the aerospace tax incentives. There are about 300 that use them currently. And uh, what they do is they, many of them put those savings uh, back into, they reinvest back into their companies and their workers. Um, they're making capital investments. They're building new facilities. They're buying equipment. Um, they're making deeper investments in their payroll. They're adding more employees. And um, the uh, aerospace actually has more employees than all of the three largest employers in the state combined. And they pay 50% more than other industries for the same skill set and the same educational attainment. They also reimburse, they also um, invest in tuition reimbursement for their employees and uh, at the highest, at one of the highest um, rates in, of, a, of all industries. So I'm going to give you an example of one of these. Um, Machinist Inc. is a company um, in the South uh, Park area that uses aerospace tax incentives. Machinist Inc. was founded in 1941 by Hugh LeBosier's grandfather. In 1971, Hugh's father, Larry, took it over. And uh, about that same time, Machinist Inc. became a key supplier to Boeing. Machinist Inc. has a very diversified customer base. In the aerospace industry, we work with Boeing and Airbus and a lot of the tier one suppliers for Boeing and Airbus. We also work in the satellite industry with uh, General Dynamics and in the space flight with Blue Origin and SpaceX. So we also work a lot in the marine industry. We work with the Coast Guard, we work with the Navy, and a lot of the ship manufacturers here in, and, and retrofitters here in Seattle. In aerospace, primarily, we support the tooling aspect of, of airplane building. And it's tooling from A to Z. Uh, you name it, if Boeing needs it, Sheena Stink will manufacture it. Currently, we have a lot of Boeing work statement going on. For the 777X, we've been working on a lot of tools. We also do a lot of fixtures for the Fredrickson facility for their hangars. We're working on some verticalizing tools for Fredrickson. And for the 737 line, we're working on some thrust reverser tools. Machinist Inc. is working heavily on the 777X program. We've done several thousands of hours worth of work on the tooling and, and research and development tools for them. This part was actually a design build. Machinist Inc. was responsible for the design and the manufacture and the installation of this part. This tool actually replaced an existing tool that is not capable of handling the larger ribs that are required for the 777X program. Machinist Inc. will hire throughout the year for the various positions, whether it be in skilled machinists or fabricators or assembly technicians. Uh, we're always looking for good people. As I said, Machinist Inc. is an example of a, a supplier that utilizes the aerospace tax incentives and reinvests those savings into their company and they're hiring. And there are companies around the state, aerospace companies around the state, that are hiring and a lot of it is due to um, the, 
the ability to reinvest back into their companies uh, directly from using the incentives or indirectly because they get increased statements of work from Boeing because Boeing's using their aerospace tax incentives. So this is very exciting for us and we're seeing, like I said, more and more companies hiring right now. So I want to play one more video. It's shorter than that one. Auburn Chevrolet has been serving the Auburn community since 1938, not just for retail sales, but also we do fleet sales and service. So that has really helped us develop deep ties to the community. Uh, we have developed a lot of sales and service retention that has continued to grow. Um, we've also seen around the same time that Boeing employees would be receiving their bonuses, significant increases in not just sales, but service retention. This year especially, we've noticed that the objective that the Chevrolet manufacturer has set for us as far as retail sales, we've well exceeded it already and we still have a week to go in, in the month, so that's an excellent way to start off the fiscal year. So that's an example of uh, Boeing workers spending their bonuses in your community. So that happens around the state, obviously. So economic prosperity um, driven by aerospace is um, something that is a real thing. And that video was done last year. So we anticipate this year um, things will be even better because things are better for aerospace overall this year. Next topic, I'm going to go to the governor's NMA executive council. Or council um, um, you may know that um, the strong economic activity that occurs as a result of aerospace, the aerospace ecosystem create, uh, centered primarily around Boeing is why Governor Inslee created this Governor's NMA Council. Um, he calls, actually it's called the Governor's Choose Washington NMA Council. And um, it, is, uh, it, was, it is designed to encourage Boeing to design, build, and assemble their next airplane in the state. Boeing refers to the airplane generically as the NMA or the new midsize airplane. The council is headed by an executive team of, uh, of the overall council, which includes um, uh, county executives from King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties. Um, your very own Larry Brown here, um, who is with uh, IAM. Uh, also SPIA, AFA, the Department of Commerce, and the Office of Financial Management. And the team is charged with identifying our state's value propositions and putting together a winning proposal. And we, we aim to do that. <laughs> so the, the council is also made up of a broader group of stakeholders, including uh, economic development groups, chambers, businesses, association, higher education, and training uh, organizations. AFA has also created an NMA task force that is independent of our board of directors. We're focused on contributing to the state's value proposition as well, rolling up into the uh, governor's council. And our uh, task force includes economic development entities and industry. Anyone, uh, if you're an AFA member, you can participate, so feel free to let me know, and we will get you included in that effort. So what we think right now about, what we think we know right now about the NMA is that it'll see, serve medium range, range routes between 3,000 to 5,200 nautical miles or 10 flight hours. It'll seat between 220 and 270 passengers. We expect it to be a wide body jet and to feature first of its kind composite fuselage along with composite wings. Um, Boeing is not talking a lot about what this may or may not be. We don't know really if it's gonna happen. They're still studying it. But uh, we are putting together um, the team now in order to move, this, f move the state forward and so that we are prepared if, when and if they do decide to, to uh, build this airplane. So you know that um, Washington is a hub of aerospace. And um, we're a world leader in commercial aircraft production. And um, we know that we have a pretty good idea that market that this market position um, is, uh, with our highly skilled workforce and deep history of supply chain knowledge, uh, would, can help us get there. 
more than 90% of all commercial aircraft in the United States undergo final assembly in Washington. Additionally, the state has made key investments in its workforce and taken steps to ensure the capabilities for landing, handling new technology being developed for the 777X composite wing also needed for the NMA take place here. Of course, Washington State holds the distinction of the global epicenter of aerospace due to Boeing's 100 plus years, year history in the state and the supplier base that has grown up around the OEM. Key regional routes go deep, with concentrations in Kings, Snohomish, Pierce, and Spokane counties. Aerospace is growing in other counties as well, with companies in 34 out of the 39 counties statewide. And as you know, Auburn is a huge part of this, and I appreciate being here with you today. Feel free to let me know if you have any questions after, today, after the uh, presentations, and thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jack Meehan. I uh, have the privilege of leading the Auburn site for the Boeing Company. Auburn is truly a world-class manufacturing facility. Uh, 300 plus acres, 4 million square feet, about 6,000 people that build 17,000 parts each and every day. Um, I'm also uh, an Auburn resident and I've raised my kids in this area, so I appreciate the offer from Mayor Backus and the city to come down and speak today. Uh, this area is very important to me. We've got strong relationships with a number of the suppliers that, that uh, Kelly shared earlier. Um, and so I'm just going to walk you through a really special event we had a few weeks ago. Uh, Mayor Backus was over for the, not only the ground opening a year, a little over a year ago, but for the uh, celebration of the facility being opened up. Uh, it's now called the Workforce Readiness Center, first building in 25 years. Uh, you can see a picture of the facility. I want to show you a video that really captures uh, what the facility is all about. The sky is the limit for this building. It's really, what are the needs of our people? And as we identify those needs, how can we fulfill those needs? This new facility is critical. We face a competitive landscape to bring in talent. And we know that skills and experience of our folks is what separates us in fabricating parts, regardless of the commodity. We go through the certification process for these manufacturing certs that allow us to do the job. It's an important process in our building airplane products. You know, the public flies on this, I fly on this, you fly on this. Training is very important, especially for this area, because we hold so many certifications in final assembly. I think every time you go, you're a little bit more educated on it. The facility we have now is, is older, and it doesn't have some of the new state-of-the-art equipment. Yeah, I have no idea what I'm walking into unless it's a room I've already been in, which is very unlikely um, given the fact that we travel all over Auburn site as well as Fredrickson. What the new facility will bring us is a centralized location, making it easier for the learners to find us and also making it easier for the teachers to have a standardized setup. We've incorporated elements in the building to prepare the employees for advanced levels of training in their areas of expertise and some of the new technologies that are emerging such as the uh, additive manufacturing, robotics, some of the advanced machining that's coming out and in the cutter grind area. I think employees will see much more easy access to joint programs since they will now be on site. This move will allow us a better opportunity to meet and understand the needs of our members by engaging them where they work with easier access to our products and services joint programs provides. And it sends a very strong message to them that Boeing has actually dedicated this type of a resource to their training. The facility allows us to take the next step to transform our culture, develop our people, implement the Boeing production system which is critical to our future. The only way we're going to continue to strive and get to that next hundred years is for us to continue to grow and learn. Continuous improvement is one of our mottos and we should continue to work on that. Training is one of those aspects of getting there because it's really about learning and growing and building the future. Thank you. 
you know, we, when we built the building, and there's a lot of great reasons for it, from the fact that we've had training done all over the Puget Sound. We've sent folks to Renton, to Everett, to Fredrickson, off-site over by the Super Mall to train. So it's been very uh, difficult to get folks connected. Um, this facility gives us one location to do it. That, that in and of itself was a great reason to build the building. Um, but I think about the comments that Lieutenant Governor made around what makes a, a company uh, what drives the value of a company. And this is a quote from William Allen, who was the CEO of our company many, many years ago. And it's our guiding principle. What we have to sell our customers is ability. Ability is not to be found in the buildings or equipment or in the machines. The ability of Boeing rests with the people who are Boeing. We absolutely believe that. We know that's what makes us more competitive. Uh, the company is in strong competition with Airbus and, and emerging competitors. Locally, we compete with outside suppliers. Uh, just because we wear the Boeing badge does not mean we're granted work. We need to compete for value, based on value, to win work. And, and at the end of the day, the machines are fantastic. The space is really important, but it's the people to make the difference. And that's why we built the building. Uh, if you could go to the next one, please. Uh, so here's a picture of the facility, two-story building, 71,000 square feet. The downstairs is entirely a factory environment. Upstairs is classrooms. Um, it has got the Boeing blue and beige, which we put on every building. We love Boeing blue. But if you go inside, there are colors I've never seen in my 32 years at the Boeing company. It's very vibrant. There's a lot of collaboration areas, areas that we know that early career folks like to work. Uh, and socialize in, so just wide open areas with, with furniture for folks to have discussions and, and brainstorm and, and collaborate. Um, you see on the lower right hand side our very first class of new hires that went through the onboarding. Uh, seven folks, there was a total of 10 that attended. We had another group last Friday and we'll be go taking a new set of employees through this facility every Friday for the foreseeable future. We are uh, hiring quickly to catch up on, uh, on staffing. Uh, its focus is around maintaining the requirements we have today to build airplanes, to maintain our certifications, to help folks maintain uh, their requirements to meet engineering specifications, uh, but more importantly, to develop the skills so that they can grow in the company. Our factories have 11 different grade levels, and we know our history as we bring people in at all different grades, uh, but they don't stay there. They grow, they invest in themselves, and we have a facility now where they can go grow themselves, take on more responsibilities, become critical skills for our company, and help, help us compete. Uh, these are just some of the, the foundational training courses that we have in there. Certifications are a big deal. We do thousands of certifications. These are the employee certifications where they go to classroom training, they do hands-on training in a lab, and they can do it in one location. It's a five minute walk from just about any facility on our site. Uh, we've made a big investments in systems and engineering training uh, using CATIA, one of our engineering systems. Um, it's critical for as we onboard new uh, tool designers, manufacturing engineers, that they have a, a place to go uh, to learn from not only instructors, but also from peers. The philosophy of the building is to take subject matter experts off the factory floor from our offices because we know peer-to-peer -peer training is one of the most effective ways to train our workforce. There's a trust factor already built in. You've got expertise in every one of the trades that we have on our site, and they can transfer that knowledge very quickly. Uh, we've got, um, in the facility, we've got a very unique production system training lab with a classroom and a hands-on training lab next door where we build little actuators. It's non-production work, but it's the basis of our Boeing production system. Uh, we've not had that lab. We've had to travel folks to different facilities in the Puget Sound area, and, and uh, we've had a temporary uh, location that we've now moved into the new facility. Every employee in Auburn will go through this lab. It is a massive commitment in understanding how we uh, operate our facility and learn the Boeing production system. Uh, we've got classes around uh, quality systems. We've got, it's the home of our apprenticeship program, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, we are the largest apprenticeship program in the Boeing Company at this city. If you add Fredrickson, we're about 55 to 60 apprentices. We're in the process of hiring more today. They are our pipeline into the future in machining, in tool and die, in blue streak, in equipment maintenance. They are the critical skills that are so important to our facility going forward. 
Um, we're also going to have the ability to, as we bring folks in, uh, to grow their skills in our equipment services craft colleges. So that's a, a way for folks that come in that may lack some training in hydraulics or pneumatics, um, want to learn how to tear down a machine. Uh, we've got several machines in the building that is hands-on training, and they'll have peer-to-peer -peer trainers to help them walk through whether they're tearing down a spindle, uh, rebuilding uh, the ways on a machine, really a cool opportunity to not only do the classroom piece, but to get the hands-on training and practice uh, so they can become uh, more advanced in their skills and also do a great job for us. Uh, we do certain things that you don't find in industry that are hard to hire for. Uh, we've got the largest uh, group of tool grinders in the Boeing Company, about 80 strong. They're the folks that make all the cutting tools that we use throughout Renton, Everett, Auburn, Charleston, and in the supply base. It's a really hard skill to hire for, very um, technically challenging. We hire that off the street, but now we have a facility we've invested in state-of-the-art equipment, brand new machines, and we're again gonna pull expert trainers off the floor to help teach them in our uh, Cutting Tool Service Center Craft College. So truly a, an opportunity to do things we haven't done before. Um, our joint programs with IAM, the head office for the South End is located there. It is the first time they've been on the site in many, many years. Uh, they've got career counseling. They help us manage the apprenticeship program. They do great things around safety training. Uh, really good partners for us to work with as we onboard new employees so that we get them started on the, on the right path. We've invested in robotics. We've got a handful of robots in the building. Uh, robots are, are very easy to buy, very easy to operate. It's when you put the end effector at the end where things get very complicated quick. Uh, we design and build all the robots at the Auburn site. There's about 60 today. I would imagine in five years that number will be double that, if not triple. Uh, the end effectors that we've designed do a multitude of manufacturing processes. The challenge has been, where do we find folks that, that develop the programs that drive the paths that those robots uh, do to, to machine, to drill, to fasten? To, to burr parts. Very talent, talented folks out in the industry, not something that we've traditionally been able to develop internally. This gives us a place to do that. Uh, we've got an opportunity uh, to add some future state programs. Uh, Boeing uh, has made a massive investment in additive manufacturing. The headquarters of that investment is at the Auburn site. Uh, we are investing in machines both for plastics as well as metal. It is cutting edge technology. It is definitely a disruptor for old time manufacturing folks like myself. It is the future. Uh, we are just now learning how to apply it, whether it's making shop aids and tools, which is what we're doing today, and non-structural parts. Um, I can only imagine the impact this is gonna have in manufacturing in the future. Uh, we've got our first additive manufacturing uh, machine in the new center, and it's, guy it's really focused around those folks that maintain our equipment, that are writing programs to grow those parts, and our designers to figure out better ways to, to utilize additive manufacturing and the building of parts. Uh, in the future, we're gonna expand our robotic program for our maintenance team, and then start to roll in some of the unique processes we have around tube manufacturing, um, tube bending, metal forming, as well as incorporating a number of the support skills that we've got on site that are just absolutely critical to our build. Our supply chain leaders, industrial engineers, uh, procurement folks, and others. It's been a great ride. It's been about 12 months to get the building built. We have already ran close to 100 people through the facility. We are just now starting to tap into the capacity and, and look forward to this just making a huge difference uh, for our company going forward. Uh, thank you, I appreciate your uh, attention today. See the people you may need to stretch your legs a little bit. I know my students would always get a little uh, rambunctious. Um, my name is Luke Kelleher. I'm the CTE director for the Auburn School District. Uh, when I first saw the list of who was coming, I was like, really? They want me here too. <laughs> and um, what it really came down to is, as I've been listening, is that we are training the beginning steps of their workforce. And thanks to the Auburn uh, city that runs, you know, I mean, you've got a great city here. It uh, allows parents to come live here, 
we uh, get them into the Auburn School District and we train them at that. And so um, what I figured I needed to give you is a little bit of uh, background on the district and what we're doing now because the Auburn schools and the classes we're teaching now are not the same ones that when I went through school. Uh, in I went to uh, Tacoma and then Stadium High School and so on. And there are just you know, things that you need to know about it. So uh, what is meant by Career Connected STEM and CT opportunities? These are terms that some people, they hear it a lot, but they really don't know what it means. Uh, first of all, uh, the understanding is what is STEM? It's science, technology, engineering, and math. And technology means everything from computers to uh, phones to um, you know, any kind of equipment that they might be using through there. And so those are things that we need to work. Uh, the first time I had heard the term STEM several years ago, as soon as they were explaining, I go, well, that's our career and technical classes because that's where STEM came from. STEM only is STEM if it is applied to something. If you're out there building and you're actually integrating your science with the technology, with your math, like if you're out on a job site doing framing and uh, such and you're having to use the Pythagorean theorem to square a wall or to square the building, you're doing STEM at that point. So it is not a item unto itself that just stands out there. It is a combination of what we do all the Boeing workers and the people working at Skills Inc. and all that, they are STEM you know, uh, purveyors. They're the ones bringing that all together. Um, CTE um, is career and technical education. For some of you, it used to be uh, vocational education. That would be the term that um, even on a lot of the federal documents, they still have it as vocational education. And I think it's because there's so many documents with it on there, they can't afford to go back and change it on all those. So, but it, um, it is, when you hear uh, CTE, the problem now is if you Google CTE, you'll also find that you have a whole lot of people dealing with the new concussion um, protocols with uh, the NFL. So. Um, I would like them to change their term because we were around before they were. So, um, as far as what are the opportunities, um, you know, education with meaning is what I always tell my students um, and our teachers. Our teachers in CTE, career and technical education, are not just math teachers, they're not just English, they're not just science. They have to bring it all together and they're doing it at job ready levels. So, they're all career oriented internships, we do job shadows, um, job training, which if any of your uh, industry people out there would like to join in with us on that, it's a plug for you to see me after this. Um, I figured I needed to use this for all its uh, intents and purposes here. We also do a lot of industry certification at the um, high school level. Uh, we also have some that they can get even in the uh, uh, Microsoft Office uh, area, even at the middle school level. Um, STEM should be Problem, so, you know, if you're a STEM student in our areas, they should be problem solvers, innovators, technology literate, and self-reliant. I mean, that's what you want in your employees. Well, we want that in our students, that we ask their parents to start it early. We then get into it starting with kindergarten all the way up through. That's why you'll see a lot of the state pushes for uh, K-12 STEM education. It is, you know, if they're just, and this doesn't, I hope this comes across right, if they're just learning math, that in itself is a good task, but they need to know where they're going to apply it as they get older. Um, we had a second grade class come from Washington Elementary to my construction class one time, and we, were, we brought him over and taught him how to read a ruler, and we were doing uh, racing sailboats at the time we were building. And they actually, at the first time, were going, oh, you mean that's where we'll use fractions? We need to know how to do that? And they got to use the laser, and they got to use other things like that, and they started realizing, Oh, it applies to that. So then when they went back to class, they had something to tie it to. And um, so many of our students, you know, you know that they're visual. I mean, watch them anytime they get near a cell phone. It's, uh, you know, that's how we need to hook them and get them into uh, the proper areas. Um, STEM CD programs uh, are, every high school has general electives. You may have taken band, art, you know, different things like that. Um, the difference is, the CD programs um, are industry focused and skills trained. They have to be. For, our, for us to run programs at the middle school and high school level, they have to be approved by the state in a pathway that shows that we are industry training them. Um, meaning everything, direct correlation. And uh, you know, these are some of the uh, areas, if you ever want to go into the Auburn School District CTE website, a lot of the areas that we deal with. Um, 
as you can see, um, it's alphabetical till. We've got manufacturing, we've got aerospace, we've got machining, welding, we've got construction, we've got auto, we've got all those areas. And um, when I saw the list that Kelly put up of uh, the companies in this area, I know that we've got past students in and working in most of those areas. And um, we had a student some years ago that went to work for, I think it's Northwest Laser, and he had taken our metals class, learned to use Mastercam, went there, uh, within a year, he was one of their sales staff and making about a million dollars for the company because he knew how to talk to people about how this applied. And, you know, as, as a teacher of his at one time, it makes me feel good, except when they come back and they brag they've got a nicer vehicle than I do <laughs> because they're making, you know, good money. So that's always uh, what they do. But just so you have a background of what Auburn has, we have um, basically 48 um, high school staff that are CTE trained, um, 10 middle school, um, they come to us in two ways. We have them straight out of college, or they can come from industry. I came from college, but I had training in industry and machining, welding, and construction that helped me get those work hours. I also um, had just hired a young man from the uh, Air Force where he was a electrical uh, engineer and stuff. He is now a mechatronics instructor at uh, Rainier uh, Middle School. And, um, and so he used his industry training to be uh, verified to be able to teach and they have to go what they call plan two which means they take courses after they come in and get taught but we're taking that industry knowledge and putting it directly into the classroom so when they talk to the students they go well where am I going to you know use this they know and they can tell them and they can get it across to them very quickly um, now the world is changing this is a slide I'd thrown in I uh, don't want to take a lot of time with you but you know our students have changed economic you know, the job market, everything, it's moving. Um, I had a student my last year of teaching, which was three years ago, uh, before I went to the, what the teachers would call the dark side, I became an administrator, and they, um, they would go, well, you know, were you always, did you, we always get to learn things like this? And I'm going, no, if you would have gotten me in my first 10 years of teaching, you wouldn't be doing half of what we're doing in the classroom now, because these things didn't exist then. My construction lab has CNC shop bots to run. Uh, it can mill out complete cabinet packages. I've got lasers so it can do uh, you know, trophy packages. It can cut out materials. And I had to learn that along with the students. So our, you know, we are upgrading them as quickly as we can. I mean, some of you may recognize some of these. This is where we were in the old typing classes and, and drafting in the, um, the, the old labs. Well, then you go to where we are now. You know, we've got the middle slide there is the underwater robotics. We just had 180 students uh, this past week um, at the uh, Auburn pool with their teams testing out their underwater robots. They actually took robots, they did all the soldering of all the um, uh, circuit boards. They wired all the motors up, they built them, they had to test them. They took them to the pool and actually competed. And this is all information that um, you know, we need to make them the most global person they can to where all of these things work together. To where when you used to have a welding class and a machining class and all that, well now we're bringing them into a manufacturing program. We're having to combine them because they, you know, in some ways my father used to say you become a jack of all trades, a king of none. Well, the jack of all trades is the one that's going to run the world. I mean, they're, they're, um, and that's where we're training. We've got 3D printers in at the elementary schools. We've got them in at the uh, middle schools. And it's for a student to come in and learn how to design and measure, like for the uh, robots, they had to design their own control box. They had to design it out, print it out, and then use it. They had to figure out what the size of the cables were going in so they could have the, the areas for that. And you're going, seventh graders are doing that? And you walk in and what I bring it to my instructors with is, we'll have instructors that, when I told them they, uh, I was bringing in 3D printers for them, they got all excited. They were going, you got some goosebumps? They're going, yeah. I go, that's what I want your students to have. Because if they're excited about what they're learning, they lock it down. And they will take you to a place where you never knew. You know, they're, they're always pushing the envelope. And so you just keep them directed in the right, uh, in the right way to go. But they will explode things on us. Um, We've also, you've also heard, I know a lot about in Auburn, we've had a lot of very successful first robotics competitions. Um, a lot of these students, once they've uh, 
you know, are at the national or even uh, world levels. They're getting uh, cards from different companies and different colleges that they want them to come there to do their engineering and to do all that. We have in our district, we have college in the classroom with our students where with the University of Washington, with Central Washington University and such, they can actually take classes there and get college credit at the same time. So we're making it relevant to why they're in high school and uh, where they're going from there. Some of the industry certifications we deal with, um, the tooling U and uh, ISETs, automotive excellence. Um, well, you see the food handler's permit. The food back there was done uh, this morning by our career and technical uh, class at um, Auburn High School. And a lot of you, when you go to different events, may have food prepared by them. So we have students doing all areas of uh, items. Uh, a couple of things you need to know, each day we have approximately 1,200 students involved in a CTE program in the district. Um, our district has 16,000 students uh, from K through 12. And um, uh, even through middle school, there's 220. The bottom area is something that I always like to bring uh, to the school board's um, knowledge. The standard graduation rate in the state of Washington is about 90, or excuse me, about 79 to 80% on average for on-time graduation. If you're involved in a CTE or an elective type of program that you buy in at that school, they call it, a, you're a completer, means you've taken 360 hours or more, your ability to graduate increases. So for, uh, at, in the Auburn School District, it was up at 91.4%. So when you're looking at going, well, you're talking better than a 10% increase just because you found something that meant something to you. So our job as instructors is to find that, you know, what's their passion, help feed that and get them going. Um, I happen to be one of the ones that went through a vocational uh, training program at Stadium High School and then uh, I went into, um, into teaching and all my background in vocational paid for my college. So when I came out I didn't have a bunch of debt. And then, um, you know, so when we take CTE courses, the one thing I really need you to understand is we train these students to always be learners. They are not only learning that subject, let's say they come out to be a framer. Okay, my, in my construction program is like, start out there, you'll, it's awesome, you're young, you're, uh, your body all works well for you, you go out and do that. But learn the billing aspect, learn uh, to run the crew, learn to own the company, you know, use it to grow, build the economy of, uh, of Auburn and go. And so we don't stop them at just going, well, just doing that is fine. No, it never is at that point. It's always the growth aspect. Um, they go on to college, trade school, apprenticeships, of course, military, and, uh, and work. Some will go straight out to work. Um, what's best? Well, it depends on the student, their family situation, and where they're going. Um, I had talked to um, uh, one of my uh, friends at Green River the other day and I would asked him, I go, do you have any stats on how many people come back to, let's say, Green River or colleges like that after they've already graduated from college with a um, BA degree? And they gave me some information, and this is rough information over several years, that in the uh, career and technical area, they've got, let's say, 200 or 25,000 students that come back to get retrained. Um, they're saying that at least 10,000 of them are now pursuing a CTE type degree so they can actually make better money. Because a lot of them will come out with a degree that made sense at the time, but the opportunities may not have been there when they came out. So now they're gonna uh, try and find something that really works for them. Uh, this I pulled out of the STEM jobs in Washington. So you can see that just, uh, I'm sorry, I tried to get it to go lighter, but it didn't work for me. Technology uh, challenged at times. Um, but as it shows down below, your uh, top regions for STEM, and of course those are those areas, King County, they, they figure that they've got 249,000 jobs opening up out there. Well, we need to feed those, along with all the other areas that we've got. Um, you know, so we're, we're looking at a lot of them. Uh, I threw a couple things in here, apprenticeships, and this is old data, um, about a year or so old. Average age coming to apprentice is approximately 32. I was hearing it had come down to about 27, but a lot of people had gone to college or they went straight to work and then they decided to come back into apprentice trades. Um, and as they work, remember if you're in an apprenticeship area, you're also getting paid as you're going to school to do that. So it's, you, you uh, are not 
costing yourself into a lot of loans. Um, now, we we're all dealing with sound transit. If um, the information we had about that is 20% of the hours dedicated into sound transit proposition three was for apprenticeships. So there's gonna be even more ability for people to get into those and actually uh, work. Um, you know, if you're a pipe fitter, um, we've gone over and visited that area. And, you know, the whole idea is it's a five-year program. I mean, a lot of people think if you go into an apprenticeship, it's like, well, it's for those people. No, you have to be darn right on the ball, you know, to do this. I mean, they expect you there every day, on time. Uh, one of our best people that comes and talks to our students, I said, please talk to my students about attendance because attendance, as you know, is always interesting. And so his comment to them is, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, I don't need you. <laughs> and the students are like, seriously? But I have a tardy pass. And I'm just going, well, you know, how many times can you use that at Boeing before they let you go? Uh, so it's, you know, it's the thing to where they need you there. That's what they're paying for you to be there. Um, this is my plug for, uh, for CTE and for uh, you to help me. It says, you know, we want our city, schools, and business to work together. The strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. And uh, so the, ne the next thing for you is, right here is, is would you like to join the pack? Um, we have CTE advisory boards. We have over um, 80 industry people that help direct what we do in Auburn School District. We have meetings each year. We have them in, uh, and I'm looking for some new uh, people to help us with our um, computer science advisory and with our mechatronics, meaning that's everything in uh, mechanical uh, and, uh, and electronics uh, to help come in and help direct our teachers to make sure we're hitting and going the right direction. But if there's something that you would like to be involved in, to come and speak to our students, um, please see Julia because we've got a um, conference coming up both at the middle school and at the high school level this year uh, where we have industry come and talk to our students and we'd love to get you even into the classroom to talk to our students to bring that kind of reality to what they're doing and how it actually blends in. So, you know, I'm sorry to do my educational side and give you the background of um, what we're doing in the district, but um, I just wanted to let you know that as we are building to feed what they need, we also need you to come down to, you know, to the, the school level to be there for us. Because if you just expect us to get them there, we can't get there without you. So, thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Todd Cleland from the University of Washington. Uh, and uh, my topic here in cleanup position here on the panel is to talk a little bit about innovation in advanced manufacturing. So I figure out how to advance my slides here, wrong way. Um, so I'm really going to talk about two, uh, cover two topics. One is to hit on some trends in advanced manufacturing, and you've heard about a couple of those already from uh, our previous speakers. And then uh, to talk to you a little bit about how you can work with the University of Washington to enhance your innovation in this area. So uh, this graphic that I found as I was putting this talk together uh, does a nice job of covering uh, some important topics in uh, manufacturing innovation. And I'm going to touch on three of these. And uh, I've actually heard about a, a couple of these already. One is additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Uh, the second one is robotics. And the third one, which actually hits on several of the topics on this diagram, is so-called smart manufacturing. Um, and that includes, uh, that covers Internet of Things, big data, um, cloud computing, and so forth. So I'll touch on those, those three topics. So starting with additive manufacturing or 3D printing. So this technology has actually been around for a long time. Um, but previously it had been limited by a li very limited range of materials, mostly a few polymers, and very slow printing speeds. So that really limited it to... Um, making prototypes uh, or even, you know, hobby use. Um, as a, a friend of mine in the industry uh, told me once, 3D printing was uh, good at making things that look like things but aren't things. And <laughs> that's beginning to change because of improvements in both uh, range of materials that you can print as well as the speed which with you can print them. So now you can print, in addition to a range of polymers, uh, materials like ceramic, ceramic glass, uh, metals, 
and even biomaterials. As, you, as illustrated by the picture of the ear on the right, not only is it uh, functional, uh, but it actually, um, sorry, not only does it look like an ear, but it's also actually a functional ear that you could, uh, could hear with. Um, so that's enabling med medical applications. Um, we're beginning to see uh, a lot of improvements in the speed of printing, and this is really changing it from a prototyping technology to a manufacturing technology. And the picture on the right, which is a little hard to see with the sun there, is a robot or an additive manufacturing tool that's printing a complicated sole on an Adidas sneaker. And I'll have another picture of that on the last slide. And the, the <coughs> picture down in the lower left there is uh, a picture of a very compl complex metal object that was printed with uh, 3D printing technique. Let's see. Just a few more pictures. The upper left is the, you can see how complicated the sole on that sneaker is. It's a, it's a shape that you couldn't create with a molding technique, so it really could only be produced um, by a additive manufacturing technology, and they're gonna be doing that in production on you know, thousands and thousands of sneakers a day. Um, the next picture over on the right is uh, uh, stainless steel, or <coughs> comes from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, this was printed with a laser sintering technology where you use a laser into a metal powder. Um, that's been around for a while, but what's new is the technology is improving to where the materials of those printed metals, uh, ductility and so forth, are getting closer to actual milled uh, steel. So that means they can be used in more applications. And then uh, on the bottom, a uh, little bit hard to see, is a, uh, oh, thank you, a production 3D printer. Uh, so uh, HP, long known for making inkjet and laser printers, has now moved into 3D printing. And the part of the market they're going after is actually the uh, market where the 3D printing can be used as a production technology. And example here in the lower right, uh, they printed a big chain link that was then used in a, kind of a marketing stunt, but it shows the, uh, the how far the technology has come to lift up a car with a crane. And so um, the materials you can print now uh, are actually strong enough to be used in you know, load-bearing applications. And as I think it was mentioned earlier, 3D printing is really a game changer because if you can print parts, then you don't have to have big inventories of them uh, that maybe are at a central location that have to be shipped. You can have 3D printers out where you need the parts and you can just create them uh, as needed. Um, also for uh, developing new uh, tools, for example, it's much quicker to go from a, a printed design to a part than if you have to go through the traditional uh, way of manufacturing. Uh, secondly, talking a little bit about robotics. Uh, so robotics, again, uh, they've been in, used in manufacturing for a long time, um, but more in specific industries like automotive manufacturing, where it's very high volume, low mix, you have a robot that does a very specific thing. It puts on a certain kind of bolt in a certain part of the car, and it does that very efficiently. Um, but it's perhaps in a cage. It can't really work together with humans. And that sort of limited its application uh, to a few industries. Um, so trends in robotics include uh, things like uh, collaborative robotics, so ro robots that can actually work uh, together to assist humans uh, rather than just being separated from humans. Um, these uh, applications here include tasks where you're addressing safety or ergonomic issues. Um, machine learning, so this is a, a, a piece of artificial intelligence. And so instead of having to hard code a robot to do a certain thing, uh, up front, the robot can actually learn on the job, so to speak. So robots can be trained to understand language, images, and video uh, while they're doing their, their tasks. So as the robot goes along, it actually gets better at what it's doing on its own, which is kind of amazing. Um, knowledge sharing, kind of related to the above topic, robots can actually teach robots. So if you can get one robot going, you can actually train further robots from the robot that you've uh, got up and running. Um, perception and sensing, so robots are getting more capable by having um, not only computer vision, but other kinds of uh, pressure, temperature, sensors that are uh, on the robot. And then you have software that figures out what to do with the input from all those sensors. And this came up, I think, in uh, uh, Jack's presentation, uh, end effectors or dexterous, dexterous manipulation. So what the robot can do really depends on um, what you can do, what it can grab and touch and manipulate. And that's often a complicated piece of getting robots to do practical things. And so there's a lot of emphasis on, on that and making a lot of progress there. 
And for down at the bottom there, it says uh, SME, small and medium businesses or enterprises. Uh, the need there really is for cheaper, easily programmed robots that can handle high mix, low volume. So the opposite of what the automotive manufacturers have been doing for years where they're producing thousands of the same car you know, every month. Uh, small and medium businesses have a need to do a high mix and low volume. So um, the changes in robotics are beginning to support that better. Let's see. Um, so the, at the UW, we have a lot of robotics research going on, uh, just hitting a few high points. We have a Boeing-funded advanced research center we call the BARC that's on campus. And it's kind of unique because um, not only is Boeing funding the research, but they have six or eight engineers that come to work there every day that work alongside students and faculty on applied manufacturing projects. And several of these are in the robotics area. And uh, for example, uh, they've uh, been working on a robot that's an in-wing crawler. This is an example of a collaborative robot that takes over some of the ergonomically challenging tasks of working inside a wing box. Um, similarly, working on projects that can help operators with projects like sanding and riveting that are uh, perhaps difficult or dangerous jobs. And so the operator's job isn't eliminated, their job just changes to guiding a robot, um, again, requiring more STEM skills, rather than doing those jobs, uh, at least the physical part of those jobs themselves. Uh, we've got a very well-regarded computer science school, a lot of work there on robotic learning sensors, computer vision and controls. The lower right picture is an example of some work um, on computer vision. And the idea is if you have uh, robots that are going to work in the same environment as humans, they have to be able to see a human and understand what it is and know where your, your extremities and your body is. And so that was what that project was, uh, was focused on. Because obviously if they know where the humans are, then they can avoid uh, running into them or, or injuring them. In electrical engineering, we have some projects on surgical robotics and haptics, which is uh, sort of sensory feedback. And um, I'll talk on a, briefly on another slide about the ARM Institute. So it's a new national institute that is focused on advanced robotics in manufacturing that the UW is a part of. And lastly, smart manufacturing. So smart manufacturing is really a term that refers to putting uh, sensors everywhere on your factory floor, on your uh, production tools, as well as on the products that you might ship out to your customers, and combining that with powerful software and data analytics. And what this allows you to do, which is kind of game changing, is on the manufacturing floor, you can monitor your equipment in a much more detailed and comprehensive way than you could before. This helps with things like predictive maintenance, um, understanding when things are going to fail so you can proactively address them, reducing downtime, better managing, uh, better managing inventory, and improving uh, energy efficiency. Uh, where these uh, sensors and software are deployed out in the field, you can better monitor your customers' equipment. Uh, providing a better experience for them as well as improve field service again by being more proactive and instead of just doing you know something every six months you can do it when it needs to be done and finally uh, these smart manufacturing technologies can more easily support mass customization so allowing your manufacturing to be more flexible um, again for the for small and medium businesses in particular challenges can include the implementation complexity and uh, cybersecurity to name a few um, one, I talked about the ARM Institute. There's another uh, national institute uh, that the UW is affiliated with called the Clean Energy Smart Manufacturing Innovation Institute, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, it goes by SESME. Uh, this institute is funded by the Department of Energy. It was like 70 million over five years with an equal or greater amount of matching from industry. And it works on workforce education and um, applied research that's led by industry in the area of smart manufacturing. So if you're interested in that, uh, you might take a look at their, uh, at their website. Um, before I move on to talk about the, how you can work with the UW, I wanted to put in a plug for Impact Washington. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it can be a great resource for uh, small and medium manufacturing companies. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it's the NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is a federal agency, uh, supports a manufacturing extension partnerships in each state uh, in the U.S. And their role really is to help companies become uh, globally competitive. And they do this through consulting and training programs in all areas of manufacturing, including manufacturing technology. So if you're interested in implementing additive manufacturing or robotics or doing smart manufacturing with more sensors and analytics, um, Impact Washington may be able to provide uh, consultants or training that could help your company 
uh, with that. <coughs> so I'll talk briefly about uh, several innovation, inter inter <coughs> innovation opportunities where companies can work with the University of Washington. Um, I've kind of got one slide on each of these. And first of all, you know, why would you want to work with, uh, with UW? Well, it's, uh, it's one of the biggest research universities in the U.S. as far as measured by the annual amount of research that gets supported there. Uh, it's usually in the top, top three. It's also been ranked number one most innovative public university by Reuters. So they were looking at things about um, uh, patents and startup companies um, and, you know, highly, uh, <coughs> highly cited scientific and engineering papers and, and things like that. Um, so the first, uh, so I, I won't read all these to you, I'll just kind of move through them as we go here. So the, the first one is sponsored research. So companies just like uh, a federal agency like the NSF or the Department of Energy can, can work directly with faculty on a sponsored research project. And the way this works is uh, often companies will start by talking to uh, someone like me or people, uh, colleagues I have at the UW who work in corporate relations who can help connect your technical interests with uh, faculty experts on campus. Um, once you find a faculty member uh, that is interested in working with you, you work together with them to define a project uh, that is both relevant for the company, obviously, since the company's funding it, uh, as well as of academic interest. So there's kind of a sweet spot there between something that's cutting edge enough to be something you could publish or present at a conference, and at the same time valuable for the companies. Um, the sponsor can license any intellectual property that's created on the project. And there's even a way to, to prepay for the license if you want to do that. And the cost depends, of course, on the scope of the project. Um, but the costs start at about 80, 80K for a one-year project. And you're mostly paying for time and materials, specifically time of graduate students who are doing most of the work supervised by a professor. Um, many small businesses um, can fund these through uh, SBIR or STTR grants. These are federal grants specifically targeted for uh, small businesses. And I'll just talk briefly about these. Um, are most of you familiar with SBIR or STTR? Or have you, anyone had experience with those kinds of grants? So these are grants that uh, the first one, SBIR, is Small Business Innovation Research. Um, these are offered through 11 federal agencies. The PI, that's our word for principal investigator or the lead on these grants is from the company. So the company is the applicant, prime applicant. They're the prime on the grants. And then if they get the money, their proposal can propose partnering with the university to do up to a third of the work in a phase one grant uh, and 50% of the work in a phase two. The second category uh, is, is similar. It's a small business technology transfer grant. These are offered by five of the 11 agencies, so it tends to be the five biggest ones also do these STTR grants. In this case, the lead can either be from the company or a university, the small business, and then there's prescribed percentages of, of how the work has to be broken down. So the small business has to do at least 40% of the work uh, on an STTR with the university doing at least uh, 30%. And to be eligible, you basically just have to meet the federal definition for a small business, which is less than 500 employees. Uh, greater than 50% U.S. owned and, of course, based in the U.S. Um, the phase ones are smaller grants, up to 150K. Uh, they're usually for a year, six to 12 months, so they're a shorter period of time. Um, if the project goes well, you can apply for a phase two, which is up to a million dollars in over, over two years. And if you're interested in these, um, the website's on the slide. It's sbr.gov, and there's proposal calls from these agencies that are uh, updated all the time on kind of a rolling basis. You can go on there and look at whether the uh, federal agency is doing a proposal call that intersects with the technology that your company is interested in. Um, so Jakati is worth mentioning, because uh, I think, imagine, uh, certainly companies in this area do a lot of manufacturing related to aerospace. So this is a State of Washington grant program that's been around for five or six years now. Um, it, it, uh, makes about 16 grants a year of between, uh, usually they're 80 to $100,000 grants. And specifically, they're in the area of uh, um, aerospace manufacturing research. And the, the way the, the projects work is uh, a company partners with a faculty member, usually at one of the state's two research universities, either at the UW or Washington State. 
Uh, they put a proposal in, um, and it's on an annual cycle. So the proposals are due in early March. They announced the decisions in June with the funding starting July 1st. And uh, basically, the, the projects are, are typically one year, although they can be renewed. And the, the faculty are working with the company on a really a problem that the company brings in from their business. Uh, so a very much of applied aerospace uh, manufacturing uh, project. And, and it's, been, uh, it's been pretty successful. Uh, they do a, uh, a uh, symposium every April. And it alternates between being in Spokane and being in Seattle. I think this year it's going to be in Spokane. Um, but if you're able to attend that, that provides a good overview of the program and the kinds of projects around the state that have been funded. I talked about this ARM Institute. Uh, this is new. Um, it's similar to that clean energy manufacturing um, institute I talked about. This one's focused on robotics and manufacturing. Um, it's funded by $80 million from DOD over five years with an equal or greater amount of industry matching funds. Uh, it has 120 members, and the focus is on applied research in robotics for manufacturing specifically. Um, the institute's based in Pittsburgh, um, and the way, they, the way it works is they're, with their uh, DOD money and industry matching money, uh, they're, they are essentially uh, make grants to um, members of the institute to do industry-led projects in advanced robotics. And, Although it's based in Pittsburgh, there are a number of regional hubs, and there's one in Seattle that's managed, or one in Washington State that's led by the UW and Impact Washington. Um, and we're just getting that rolling, and there's gonna be a workshop in, probably at the UW in March, to introduce this institute to uh, local industry. So if you're interested in that, uh, send me an email, and I can get you on the invitation list uh, to learn more about the ARM Institute. Um, consulting. Um, so we're moving on. So those are all things about uh, how you can work with us directly on research projects. You can also hire faculty as consultants. Um, so uh, people such as myself in corporate relations can help you identify faculty with appropriate expertise. They can consult up to 20% of their time. And uh, it can be a great way to get really focused expertise on a you know, particular technical problem that you might be having. Industry capstone projects, so these are projects that are, uh, this is kind of a new program, we're in our third year. Uh, with the industry capstones, companies can bring in a problem from their business and a team of senior engineering students work on that project for two quarters as a capstone design project in their last year of their engineering degree. Um, the companies pay a 15K sponsorship fee, so it's pretty inexpensive. Um, and they provide a mentor who meets with the team at least weekly, either virtually or ideally in person, to kind of coach the team and keep them on track. Uh, it can be a great way to uh, uh, get some smart, motivated engineers that are about to enter the workforce uh, working on a problem that you have. It also can be a good way to evaluate talent, uh, uh, take a good look at some engineers that you might want to, uh, to hire. You can also, of course, hire engineers as interns. Often these are summer internships. These are paid positions where the, the engineers, uh, usually often after their sophomore or junior year, uh, come into a company. Uh, but it can also be for two or three quarters. So it could be a summer plus a fall or a spring plus a summer. Um, it's really pretty flexible. Um, you can recruit students through our career center uh, in the engineering school, uh, where they have a website and uh, can help you identify students that might be interested in openings at your company. And it's, it's great career experience for the students, and about two-thirds of our graduating engineering students uh, do at least one internship uh, while they're at the UW. Um, <clears throat> the university has a lot of what we call user facilities. So I talked about research. That's where you're working directly with a professor. We also have a number of facilities with specialized equipment that you can access directly without having to connect with a faculty member or do a contract with our Office of Research. Uh, these are facilities like our wind tunnel, uh, our environmental health lab, and our molecular analysis facility. So this allows companies to get access to sophisticated, expensive equipment that would either be hard to find or expensive to access, um, probably prohibitive to actually acquire yourself. Um, you can, and they're all set up with uh, rate sheets. You're just paying per hour for the equipment that you're, uh, that you're using. And you can even, if it's a recurring use, Many of these facilities will actually allow 
you to have an employee come in who gets trained on how to use that equipment who can actually run your samples or your job uh, themselves, um, or you can have someone who's uh, embedded as staff in those facilities do that for you. Um, licensing, so um, as a research university, uh, the University of Washington has a lot of technology and inventions that are already, uh, have already been developed and are available to license. And we have a tech transfer office uh, called uh, Comotion, which handles the, manages the university's IP and can help you figure out what intellectual property is available to license, um, and that includes patents as well as software and tools. And uh, uh, they can help you understand how you can acquire that, a license to that technology either exclusively or not exclusively. And I think, yeah, that's, that covers it. So I've been through, those are like kind of six different areas where companies are, you know, invited to work with the University of Washington and, you know, find a way that works for your company to work with us on an R&D project or an innovation project. And just our contact information, I think you have the slides. Uh, we have a, a good website. If you just Google on uh, corporate relations on the UW's website, you will you will find us. And there's a lot of good information and downloadable flyers and other, other stuff there. Great. Thank you. So in the, in, in the current conversation, the word trickle-down is used a lot right now. And I guess I'm curious, Jack, with the standard of training that that new readiness center is put, being put out there by Boeing, is there been talk about what you think the impact of that's going to be from quality of employee training and, and it with, it within the supply chain that you deal with? We traditional way of training has been put them on the factory floor and wish them good luck, typically pair them up with a mentor. Uh, our plan ultimately, a new employee will go through three sessions of training. They will not report on the factory floor from somewhere between four and five weeks. Um, we are setting some standards with some of the course curriculum that are absolutely will, will extend through the supply chain. Uh, we've had, uh, we've got a great relationship with several of the community manufacturing partners, folks like Orion and Skills and Lighthouse of the Blind. Uh, they are an extension of our company and we've had them in for additional training and we'll continue to offer that. Uh, the Boeing production system training will be extended through uh, the supply chain, through our supply chain organization. This is going to change the way that we onboard and develop folks moving forward. This is a career uh, facility that will help folks as they move and navigate through the different <laughs> skill skill codes. So many of our folks when they come in to the company have an opportunity to go back to school. Uh, we're exploring some alliances with engineering schools so that they don't have to travel to Everett, which is typically where our folks go to get um, uh, an engineering degree. And so we're, we're exploring that opportunity to do it uh, at night when folks are off work and have the time to go do it. Um, in our facility. So the, the sky is really the limit for what we're going to be able to offer. Uh, Todd Dennington from Skills Incorporated. Uh, thank you for your presentations, all four of you. Um, Jack, I'm curious just to tap into you again, how you see jobs changing. So maybe employment and manufacturing isn't going to grow in the future because the systems are producing so much, right? But how are the skill sets changing and what are the jobs of the future that you see? Uh, and just maybe comment on that, please. Okay. You know, one of the, the, the significant changes we're seeing is uh, the use of advanced computers and uh, robotics and advanced technologies where you're separating the, um, the person from the machine. Um, our robotics lines don't require somebody to watch the spindle or the end effector perform. And so what we're, and we're, the job descriptions that we've worked with the union are allowing us now to develop folks to do multiple uh, skills, to have multiple skills and run multiple pieces of equipment. Uh, that's only going to continue. Um, the, the great side of that equation is far fewer people are going to get hurt. The ergonomic risk reduces greatly uh, with the advent of, the advent of these new technologies. Um, but the skills required to operate the equipment are much more complex. 
you're going to need to have some basics like uh, many of our robotic cell operators are folks that uh, had different jobs within the company and it takes a significant amount of time to get them comfortable to a position where they can work safely in a robotic cell uh, they can operate the equipment uh, handle the tools and, and make sure that uh, they're productive in, in the work they do. It can take a couple of years. Uh, ultimately, we hope to get those folks in the in the front door that have that skill set, but it is going to continue to morph where folks are going to need to have strong computer skills, uh, the ability to problem solve on the fly, and to manage a cell, a cell of, of equipment, multiple stations, rather than monitoring one. Lou, I think I've heard you talk before about concerns with state requirements for graduation and the number of CTE credits that can be obtained. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe what what we could advocate for in, in that case? You're trying to get me in trouble. Um, yeah, uh, with those of you that maybe have or haven't seen, uh, with the new Core 24 uh, information being uh, pushed out, um, trying to make everyone more college and career ready, um, they have increased math and English and, uh, and science requirements, um, did not increase the uh, career and technical um, assignment to it. But the state did put in some information to help us as far as um, if they're not going to a four-year college um, and so not using their two-year or two credits of uh, foreign language, they could use that towards a pathway. Um, there are really um, a lot of language around the career connected learning and knowing where your pathway is. And, um, and so they can use some of those extra credits in that area in that. Um, I guess for your support would be is to always keep asking those questions. Pay, you know, pay attention to the, because so many students um, are a hands-on learner. You know, they're the, they, they learn it better if they can actually go out and make it work or whatever. You know, just giving them the book to do it may not uh, make it for a lot of our students. So to actually go out and apply it. And um, a lot of the people that are on the heck board that make these decisions are all college, you know, trained. So of course, that got them to where they needed to be, trained them well. And so they, um, they make the assumption that that is how everyone should be trained. And so I did appreciate the fact that in there, they gave a little bit more information on how we could go with uh, career pathways. So, um, but as, as you hear that, please make sure if you ever see anything on career 24, uh, Core 24, make sure you see things about career pathways in there. If they start to um, shorten that up a little bit, let us know and we'll, you know, we're trying to be in those conversations as they're having them. So my name's Doug Happy. I own a business here in Auburn. We uh, are a HVAC contractor and we manufacture sheet metal work. I'm also on the uh, executive board for the Auburn Chamber of Commerce as well as executive board for Auburn Youth and Families. I have a question for Kelly. You mentioned that uh, the bill that went before our governor uh, for reducing the B&O tax for manufacturing facilities that was part of the overall transportation package that was brought to the governor. And that was the one thing he picked out and vetoed. Now we have a total democratic legislature. Give us some hope that that might pass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, you know, I don't. I don't know if it'll pass. The two bills that I mentioned are both backed by or sponsored by Republicans, but there are some Democrats, as I understand it, who are supportive of those bills. Who knows if if they'll go forward, uh, especially in this short session. Um, there's another bill, 2940, House Bill 2940, that is um, sponsored by a Democrat, but that came out very, very late last week, and it's having um, a hearing today in the House Finance Committee. That bill, we don't quite uh, have enough clarity on to really understand what the direction is of it or who might be behind it. Um, so I, I can't really give you a lot of hope. We have hope, but. Um, we don't we don't really know how far it'll get I I you know I'd love to say that that it'll go forward this this year but I, but I just don't know but we will we will be in there monitoring them and um, and uh, supporting the ones that make sense for for the manufacturing community 
Hopefully you have found your time with us today to be valuable, that you've learned a little bit about what's currently going on in the industry and what our future is going to look like with what's going on both at the school level, at the um, middle and high school level, and at the university level. I think it's very exciting to know that we have great opportunities ahead of us and also that we have companies who are fully supported and committed to manufacturing in our region and especially in our community. Uh, Julia had asked me about, uh, some of you may know about the streamlined sales tax and, and what's going on in the state of Washington as far as uh, point of destination as a point as uh, instead of point of sale. And Auburn has been one of those, if you will, loser communities since the SST went into effect several years ago, and we have been receiving some mitigation on that. However, in the future, that mitigation is going to be going away, and so Julia was asking, what does that mean for manufacturing? Well, it only means good things for manufacturing, because at the SST, the, the biggest impact is on warehousing. And if uh, the Auburn Valley, the Kent Valley, this entire 167 corridor, there is a lot of warehousing. And that means that the tax on a sale from that warehouse, we no longer receive the benefit of. So it only improves the opportunities for manufacturing in this area uh, as we, we want to make sure that we maintain warehousing because it's critical for our ports, critical for uh, transportation needs, but we also need to make sure that we are doing the right thing for our communities. So manufacturing is only going to increase, in my opinion, in our area and the opportunities to grow your companies. And so I, I think that's very exciting uh, for our future and look forward to how we as the City of Auburn can work with you and your businesses in the community, how we can help you thrive, succeed, grow. Most of you probably know Doug Lean. Many of you probably were strong-armed to get here today because of Doug Lean. But we are here to help you as a city. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, your, several of your council members were here because they believe in manufacturing and the strong family wage jobs that are provided through your industry and through what you are doing. So I want to give you a personal thank you for what you're doing and the opportunities that you're providing for our youth and uh, the entrepreneurial spirit that goes along with that. And so if you would join with me to thank our guests today, we had Kelly Maloney, and we have Jack Meehan, Lou Kelleher, and Todd Cleland. Please give them a round of applause for their time and their expertise. And so as we wrap up, hopefully you'll have a chance, enjoy more food that was provided by the culinary arts program at Auburn High School. And I'm sure our panelists would be happy to answer any questions that you might have thought of since we, since we have already gone through the Q&A portion. Uh, talk, am talk amongst yourselves and enjoy this beautiful morning. Thank you so much for being here.